Um, can you guys see my screen? All right, okay, sounds good. So yeah, a few folks have said yes. Um, so yeah, I'm guessing the text is uh, uh, visible enough and everything. If there are any problems, uh, please let us know. All right, um, sounds good. So yeah, so um, welcome everyone to the session and uh, also sorry for the small uh, technical glitch. Um, so my name is Jay Pillai um, and today uh, we're gonna talk about um, image generation uh, by using diffusion models. Uh, so yeah, so before uh, before we look at the session, um, here's a quick uh, overview of uh, myself. So yeah, again, my name is uh, Jay Pillai. Um, I'm currently a, a director of applied sciences at Amazon uh, in the in the Bay Area, and um, I'm also an interview kickstart instructor and course creator. Um, I also mentor um, fresh graduates and and engineering managers um, in their uh, career growth. Uh, before, um, I was a senior engineering manager at Apple. Um, so I used to run a few teams in, in AI ML in Apple, and we used to build uh, ML and AI models in a bunch of uh, products in Apple, like the, the camera, photos, iMessage, and so on. Um, I was also an engineering manager at, um, at Google, um, at both Google DeepMind and also at Google Research. Um, before I was a research engineer at Amazon, which was like my first job out of grad school. Um, I also did a PhD before in machine learning um, long back before ML was hot. Um, I've also added my, uh, my LinkedIn here. If you guys wanna follow me, uh, I'm pretty active there. Um, so yeah, so that's that's all about me. Um, so now we're gonna get into the session. Um, so so what is the goal of the session? Um, to me, there are a few goals. Um, first is, um, I'm sure like many of you guys are attending this session to understand more about the um, uh, the interview kickstart in general and the type of courses we cover. So so one of the goals for me is to give you a quick overview of the type of content we cover so that you guys will get a better feel of the whole uh, programs we offer. Um, so that's one of the goals. Um, of course, the major goal is to like introduce um, generative AI and image diffusion models. Um, so we'll do a very quick in introduction into like this field. Of course, it's a very uh, broad field, but I hope that you guys would understand the basics of um, generative AI, image diffusion models in the course. Um, so that's, that's one of the goal of this session. Uh, we'll do a very quick uh, coding after that. Um, of course, there won't be time to like build the actual bot end to end, uh, but we'll look at one of the popular image diffusion models and we'll kind of look at how to how to like run these models and then generate images. Um, of course, we're not gonna focus a lot on depth today because um, it's a very short session today of around like 40 minutes. Uh, but of course, like if you actually take um, some of the programs we offer, like ML switch up, uh, we go into a lot more depth in these programs. Um, so, so to give you guys a um, an interesting preview of the power of um, generative AI and image diffusion models, um, we have an image on the right. Uh, so this is an image generated by one of the image diffusion models uh, when you actually give a text query here. So the text query is like uh, people walking on a beach uh, during sunrise um, and so on, like realistic and so on. Uh, but you can see that the image is generated. Um, it's actually pretty pretty good. Like it's high resolution, it follows the text um, and it's it's really powerful. So, so that's a big power of, um, of image diffusion models. Uh, of course, there are similar models in the text domain too, um, models like, uh, the GPT models used by chat GPT, uh, which is making generative AI very popular. Uh, but in today's session, we're gonna follow, uh, we're gonna mostly focus on um, image diffusion models. Um, also, um, I want these sessions to be very interactive. Um, so if you guys have questions, feel free to stop me at any point. Uh, we'll cover some of the questions during the session. 
and uh, rest of the questions we'll take uh, at the end of the session. So yeah, feel free to ask questions um, and then like, uh, let's keep it very interactive. All right, um, so yeah, so, so that's all about the goals of the session. Um, so I have one more slide here, uh, a bit more uh, detailed overview of what we'll cover um, in the next 40 to 50 minutes. Um, so we'll first look at um, what is generative AI uh, or gen AI. Um, we we'll look at what it actually means. Um, what are the type of machine learning models which are used in generative AI and uh, what, what does it do? Uh, so we'll look at that first. Uh, then we'll focus on image diffusion models. Um, these are generative AI models in the image domain. Um, so we'll look at uh, image diffusion models in more detail. Um, we look at why they are useful. Um, why should you learn about image diffusion models? Uh, it of course opens a wide variety of applications. Um, so we look at some of these applications. Um, we'll then look at the intuition behind these models. Um, so we won't be covering a lot of math in this session because the math of course needs more prerequisites. Um, but we'll look at the intuition why these models work. Um, how does a training look? Um, uh, what is the intuition behind that? Um, how would the inference work with these models? So we'll look at those. Um, and then we'll do a short um, coding deep dive where we'll use one of the popular image diffusion models um, from the uh, Stability AI uh, company. So we'll look at uh, the model uh, we'll, we'll load it, we'll do some inference with these models to actually get images. Um, and then we'll, we'll um, summarize. Um, so of course, like as you can see in the, in the content, um, we're gonna mostly focus on the AI and ML side of building an image generation bot. Um, of course, there are a lot of other things uh, to build a bot. You have to look at um, the service you want to run where the models would be deployed. Um, you want to figure out like how are you going to like run these models? Is it a CLI? Um, are you going to build an, uh, an an application, maybe a mobile application, and so on? Um, so we're not going to cover any of that in today's session. Uh, but of course, if you are taking some of the programs which we offer, uh, you also have an option to do a a a, a bigger uh, project where you could like kind of apply all this and actually build applications. Uh, where you can use generative AI models for cool applications. So yeah, so um, again, before we start one more slide, um, this is about the known goal. So what are things we're not gonna cover um, in today's session? Um, and again, it's it's mostly because um, we don't have enough time to cover the prerequisites. Um, and of course the session is short. Um, so, so of course, we're not going to go be, uh, go into the math behind diffusion models. Uh, of course, if you take the actual uh, programs we offer, like the ML switch up course, for example, we will go into the math and the prerequisites and so on. Um, so of course, this is not covered uh, today. Uh, we won't look um, in depth at the training. Um, so we're not going to do a coding assignment where we actually load data sets um, um, fine tune these models and then like evaluate these models. Um, this is something we do in pretty much all of our um, sessions in the ML switch up program, but of course like that takes more time. Um, so yeah, so we're not gonna do any coding exercise with um, where we train the models. Um, and of course, like we're also not gonna build, let's say um, maybe a CLI or a mobile application where we actually like run these models. So we're gonna mostly focus on the core uh, AI um, behind these models in today's session. Um, so yeah, so I guess I guess the the overview of the session is clear. Um, if you guys have any questions, um, feel free to ask. Uh, let me also quickly look at the Q and A to see if uh, if there are any questions to answer. Um, okay, so I don't see much questions. Um, I guess there's a question from Jasteeb um, if. The, the recording will be available. Um, maybe I'll let like Abhinav answer that. Um, uh, 
Uh, not sure if Abhinav. Yeah, uh, so yeah, we'll 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 make sure. Just we will share the uh, recording link with you once we are done with the session. That's fine. Okay. So yeah. So we'll we'll share the recording after the session. All right. Sounds good. So yeah. Let's, so let's let's actually dive into the session. Um, so yeah. So the first question is, um, what is generative AI? Um, generative AI is a class of machine learning models. Um, or AI models, as we call it now. And what do these models do? So they're going to take a, a distribution of images as input. So, um, so these models would take a lot of examples as input. Um, so in our case, we're going to look at images as input, but um, this could also be like maybe text, um, like kind of sentences as input, which is what um, the large language models, which is again a very popular category of um, generative AI models take. Um, so yeah, so these models are going to take um, samples from a distribution as input. Samples can be images um, in terms of uh, image diffusion models. It could be text, it could be speech, it could be video, and so on. Um, and then you would train this model, taking all of these samples as input. Um, and then what is cool about these models is once these models are trained, um, they can generate new samples, which um, kind of belong to this distribution. So, so in our cat example here, um, so we're gonna train a model with a bunch of cat images as input, and then we get the trained model here. Um, and then what you can do is um, once a model is trained, um, you can um, do inference with these models and generate a lot of uh, new samples. So here's an example. So we got a cat image here. Um, this image may not be present in our training data set at all, uh, but it follows all the characteristics of a cat. Um, so if you train a generative AI model uh, on text, then you can make it like um, do question answering, which is what like um, models, um, GPT-like models do, let's say in applications like chat GPT. But you can also do a lot of other things. Like with speech, if you train it using speech, you can make it like um, answer questions by giving like real speech. Uh, if you train it on images, you can get images as output. Um, if you train it on videos, you can get new videos. So in other words, um, as we have written here, um, it's gonna learn to predict samples uh, from a distribution which is close to the data um, it saw before. Uh, so what are image diffusion models? Um, image diffusion models are a subset of generative AI models. Um, so these are all models in the image domain. Um, so, so of course, like what they generate as output would be images. Um, what is cool about these models is um, they can take a lot of different inputs. Um, sometimes you can just take noise as input and then you can generate an image. Um, so this is an example here. So here we have like uh, some noise which is given as input um, and then we can do a lot of denoising multiple times and get a an image which looks real. So in this case, we got this uh, flower as input. But these models can also take a lot of other, other inputs. Um, so it may take some text as input, in which case um, it can generate images uh, kind of meeting the uh, whatever text was given as input. Um, very similar to the example we saw in the in the first slide where we kind of got that um, image of the sun sunset. Uh, it could also take other things as input. So maybe you can take another image as input and and maybe make this image sharper. It could take like uh, mass as input, boxes as input, and so on. Um, so depending on the type of inputs you give, um, it can solve many different problems. Uh, but the crux you want to understand is um, image diffusion models are um, generative AI models, and uh, these are going to generate images as output. So, um, so what are examples of um, image diffusion models? I already touched a few before, but we're going to see like more examples here. Um, so one of the uses of um, image diffusion models is um, denoising. Um, so in denoising, um, you're going to give a noisy image as input. Um, so here's an example. Um, so this image is like very, very noisy. Um, in reality, um, the images may be like not as noisy as this, but uh, it'll also work with very noisy images. So you, you give a noisy image as input, um, you will run it through your um, image diffusion model here, and then you can get like um, clear images. So that's a denoising problem. 
Um, you could also use it for image in painting. Um, so in image in painting, you're gonna take uh, uh, an image here. You're also gonna take a mask here. So, um, So yeah, so uh, so we're also gonna take this mask. So this is the mask, right? So this is a mask, right? Um, so you can take the mask and the image as input. And then what the model can do is it can remove the object in the mask. So if you look here, um, you actually got the background image. So whatever object was there in the mask was removed. Um, this has a lot of use cases. So if you if you went on vacation and you take a, took a selfie and there are like a few people behind you, um, you could use image in painting to like remove all of those people and get like kind of better images. Uh, so, so this is again, very useful um, uh, application for which you can use image diffusion models. Uh, more examples, uh, text to image. This is something which is very popular again. Um, so this is gonna take uh, text as input. Um, and then the model is gonna predict an image which matches the text. Um, so in our case, the text says like a man walking on a on a rainy night and so on. And then it can generate a very realistic image which matches um, these constraints. Um, this is very interesting because um, this was a problem uh, folks in computer vision used to look at for a long time. And uh, previous methods could never generate a realistic image. So you may get a very tiny image, which is low resolution before. But once these image diffusion models um, became available, the quality of the images became much better and um, that opened a wide variety of new applications. Um, so more examples, um, again, as I was telling before, you can give multiple inputs to these models. Um, so here is an example where we give uh, two inputs. Um, both of them are images. So your input one is this guy. Um, it's, a, it's a content image. And then the input two is a style image. Um, so in our case here, the style image is a winter image and the content image is like an image of a, of a bridge. Um, and then the model can generate a new image which has the same content, but uh, with the style of the style image. So it, it looks like the same place, but, uh, but in winter. Um, so that, that's another use case. Um, and of course this has a lot of use cases like um, you could generate filters um, and then uh, for like faces, for like backgrounds and so on. Um, now we're gonna look at some real applications, but before I go there, I'm curious if you guys have any questions, like do you understand um, what are image diffusion models? Are there, are there any questions? Loads, loads in the q &A. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. So let me let me look at the Q and A. So maybe I'll take a few questions and then um, I'll go further. So yeah, Rahul has a question. Uh, does it matter if the distribution has only color or gray images, or it's not dependent? Yeah, it's it. That's a good question. So yeah, it's it's not dependent. Um, that's one of the advantages of um, these models because it can take any tensor as input. Um, so if your distribution just has um, grayscale images. The, the model is of course only gonna predict grayscale images. Um, so for example, if you had a new application where, which is a text to image use case, but um, all of the training images are grayscale, um, it's now only gonna generate like um, text to image, like images which are all grayscale. So you can use any distribution. Uh, the model is only gonna generate um, new samples from the same distribution. Um, and then Daniel had a question. If you say, when you say model, what exactly is that? Um, from a data storage perspective, text file, relational data, JSON, XML, other files, and um, usually how big uh, it has to get before it's actually useful. Yeah, so that's that's a really good question. So so yeah, so 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 basically, um, Daniel. So model is actually a um, a file. Um, the file typically contains two things. Um, it contains the weights. So, so we'll actually see one um, one model in the in the coming slide. So I'll explain this a bit more there. Uh, but basically, the 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 file would contain two information. One is some information about the architecture. Um, so things like what are the layers in the in the model. Um, so typically for neural network like models, there are multiple layers. 
So you want to know how many layers are there in the model? How are the layers connected? Um, so these are all called the architecture information. Um, and then layers will also contain some weights, um, which kind of decide how the models are trained and how they would behave. Um, so both of this information would be stored. Um, and typically these are stored in like um, some, some data like binary files. So, uh, so basically not as text files, but as um, binary files so that um, they're like more compact. Um, and I guess the next question Daniel had was how big uh, it has to get before it's actually useful. Um, so, so that's a good question. So the size of the model, the model file um, actually doesn't uh, matter. It actually depends on how complex your problem is. So if you have a very simple problem, uh, maybe uh, let's say you are predicting like, I don't know, um, a, a white or black ink. So maybe you have like, let, let's forget the diffusion problem. Maybe you're doing like a simple um, AI problem where um, you are given an image, you just want to know whether it's like a black image or a white image. Um, so for a very simple problem, you can use a really tiny model. So it may the size of the model may only be a few like a kilobytes, maybe like 500 KB, and the model is going to work like really well. Um, you can have like really complex problems where you need lots and lots of parameters and the model is actually going to be like really, really large. Um, so, so basically like, um, um, so for example, like if you look at large language models, um, these have like billions of parameters and um, it's going to take a few gigabytes of size to like store these models. Um, so yeah, so basically the size of the model is dependent on the complexity of the problem. So if you have very simple problems, you can have tiny models. Uh, but image diff diffusion, the one which we are going to see today, is a pretty complex problem um, if you actually want to have like high resolution results. Um, so these models are like really large. Like it could easily become like um, um, easily megabytes and even like, even like GB um, of size. Um, so yeah, that's a good question. Um, um, I'll maybe take like, um, I don't know, maybe another three more minutes of questions and then we'll take the rest later. Um, and there's an anonymous question, do LLM models need the data to be labeled during training or could they work on unlabeled data set? Um, so yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so in this session, we're not gonna talk about LLMs. LLMs are like large language models. Um, these are, one category of generative AI models. Uh, but um, the question is like, yeah, does LLM models need um, labeled data or can they use unlabeled data? LLM models um, can actually use unlabeled data because they are trained to predict the next word. Um, so if you have a sentence like, um, the weather today is sunny, uh, then it's, it's gonna predict the word sunny given the words like the weather today is. Um, so yeah, so you actually don't need any labeling. You just need like text, uh, which is available. Um, and that's why these models are like, um, can be trained on huge amounts of text because you can just go to like all the text available in um, in the web and then train using them. Um, so yeah, that's a good question. Uh, Amit has a question. So the diffusion model is not just finding the image from a set of training images, but actually generating this image from scratch. Yeah, so, th so that's actually, that's a good question. So, and yeah, that's correct. Um, so so yeah, if you if you have a small uh, training set and if it's just gonna return one of the images all the time, then it's not very useful. Uh, even if it can like give a different image, but if it's coming just from the training set. So yeah, so the diffusion model is actually generating an entirely new image. Um, and that's why um, you can actually give like very complex queries, for example, let's say for a text to image use case, uh, which is not there in the um, in the training data set at all. Um, these models have learned enough about how natural images look that they can generate an entirely new, new image. Um, so yeah, so maybe I'll take one more minute of questions and then we'll come back. These are all very interesting questions. So thank you for asking. Uh, Nisha has a question, uh, what's the use case for denoising? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the slide I saw showed about denoising was a bit um, misleading in the sense that I showed a very noisy image and a very clean image. Uh, in reality, you have like slightly noisy image and then you wanna make it better. Um, so some of the use cases may be like, maybe you had like an old image taken from an old camera and then it has a lot of noise in it. Um, or there may be like some sensors which are um, used for taking pictures. Um, so maybe like, I don't know, Street View, for example, like when I was in Google Maps, 
we were looking at street view images and it was very common to have like maybe some some speck of dirt on the camera lens and the image gets very blurred um and if you can actually make the image better um either like kind of removing the blur removing the noise which is there in the sensor then the image would look a lot more pleasant so there are lots of use cases for denoising um it's um 658 so we're gonna go to the content now and um i'll take the rest of the questions um, maybe I'll I'll kind of like do some more after a bit of time, and then all the remaining questions we'll do at the end of the um, of the lecture. So yeah, great questions. Keep keep asking the questions. Um, all right. So coming back. So so yeah. So so what did we learn till now? Um, we understood what are um, generative AI uh, models. Um, we also understood uh, what are image diffusion models. Uh, we saw a few examples of image diffusion models where the in input could be like um, either noise, it could be text, it could be multiple images and so on. And now before we actually look at these models in depth, um, it's also good to understand where these models can be applied so that you can kind of understand the amount of um, opportunities these models open up. Um, so we're gonna look at applications. Um, so one of the common use cases or applications of these models are for uh, content creation. Um, so let's say um, um, a good example is this Adobe Firefly. Um, so let's say you wanna you wanna create um, some images. Maybe you're making a new poster, um, and you want to like uh, maybe it's Christmas time. You wanna create like a snowman image similar to the one we have here. Um, one of the ways you could do is you can quickly describe this image either in text um, or you could even draw like a rough diagram. Like you just draw a couple of circles and you also say like snowman. Um, and then the model can take these as input and then generate a realistic image. Um, so this is very useful for quickly generating uh, creative content. Um, it's also useful in like um, e-commerce, um, like in, in retail, maybe you're selling a product, um, you want to have like kind of really pretty images of the product so that people will buy it more. Um, you can maybe have like one or two images of the product and then send a query to the model to to create like more pretty high resolution images. Um, you can use it for like marketing where maybe you want to create a new ad and you can just give a text prompt and say, uh, generate a corgi with a with a cap and so on. Um, so lots of um, use cases where you want to generate um, images. Um, uh, there are also other use cases like text to video, for example, and um, this may help in maybe creating movies, for example. Um, so, and, and the other is like um, special effects in, in, in entertainment. So you could just do a query, a uh, text query as input, like maybe a, a cat, a dog, and a horse. And then you can actually create a video um, matching the query. Um, so lots of use cases where you can create like very interesting videos giving a text query. Um, you can use it for like editing images. Um, so. So this is an example where you have a grayscale image and then you convert it to color images. Um, you can do super resolution. Um, this is, if you have a low resolution image, um, you can you wanna make it high resolution. Um, Bicubic is a non-generative AI technique that was available in the field before. Um, and then once you use image diffusion, um, the images become a lot more prettier. So if you look at the example here where the eyes of the cat is, zoomed in, yeah, you can see that the, the eyes are like much more clearer and high resolution if you use Im, um, image diffusion. Um, and then here is an example where um, you want to like remove some objects in the image with in painting. Um, so if you have a few like kind of white areas, maybe you're on a vacation and um, there are some people behind in your selfie, um, you could just like uh, kind of quickly draw that region and then use the model to like remove that region and then make it look like a natural image without the region. So in painting again, it's, a, uh, it's an important use case. Um, so, so now we're gonna look at um, the intuition behind these models. Um, so of course, we're not gonna go into the math in depth because that would need a lot more uh, prerequisites, uh, which we don't expect for this session. But as I was telling before, like if you actually take one of these courses in depth, then we go through the math in detail and then 
kind of cover all of these um, all of these topics um, step by step and pretty extensively. So, so today we're just going to look at the intuition, like how do, how why does these models work? Um, so to understand the intuition, um, there are two main concepts. Um, one is called the forward diffusion process. Um, so for in in a forward diffusion process, um, what happens is you start with a clean image. Um, so here is an example. So this image is very clean. Um, it's the image of a cat. Um, you add noise to the image. Um, so the image kind of becomes noisy. So this image is like a bit more noisy than the first image. So this is the first image. Second image is a bit more noisy. Um, and then you can keep adding more and more noise. So the third image has more noise. Fourth image has even more noise. And then once you reach like this image here, um, you can't even see the cat. Um, it, it's like completely noisy um, and you can't kind of understand any information in this image. Uh, this process is called the forward diffusion process. So you typically add some Gaussian noise to the image. The image kind of gets uh, noisy and noisy. Um, this is very easy to do. Um, you can just like generate some Gaussian noise, let's say NumPy, and then just add it to the um, image. So this is easy to do. There's no, uh, no difficulty in doing this. But then uh, there is a second concept called reverse diffusion process. Um, in the reverse diffusion process, you want to do the reverse idea, which is take this noise image and then keep removing noise so that the uh, image becomes clearer and clearer. And then if you can do this well, in the end, you can actually get a very clear image. Um, this is extremely hard to do. Uh, because removing noise is not very trivial. Like even for humans, it's very hard. Um, so if you are shown this first image here, uh, for me, it's impossible to know like what is in this image. Uh, so as a human, I can't figure out that there is a cat in this image. So this is very hard for even humans to do. Uh, but that is where these models are interesting. Uh, so you can actually learn a machine learning model uh, which can predict the noise in the image. Um, so you will first predict the noise in the image. And of course, if you can predict the noise, then you can just like subtract the predicted noise and then get a slightly cleaner image. And then in theory, if you do it multiple times, the image should become clearer and clearer. And this is how the diffusion models work in theory. Um, so you basically train uh, uh, an AI or, or a machine learning model um, using lots and lots of training data where the model is trained to predict the noise in the image. So you um, take an image, make the model predict noise, and then if you can predict the noise, well, you subtract the noise, so the image gets cleaner. And then if you can do this multiple times, the image should become better and better. Uh, this is the fundamental intuition behind um, all of these image diffusion models. Now, the big question is like, how do you predict uh, noise? Um, so we're gonna look at an actual um, model which can do this. Um, so this is this model is called uh, unit architecture. Uh, the reason why it's called U is because, um, unit is because like, um, if you kind of look at this architecture, it kind of becomes uh, narrow and narrow in the middle and then it kind of becomes uh, wide again, so it's 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 like a U. So it kind of is like a U alphabet, which is why it's called a unit. Um, again, um, these are architectures we'll cover in a lot more depth in the actual uh, ML switch up uh, program. But in this session, I'm gonna give you a quick intuition about um, what this architecture is, um, how does it actually work. Um, so um, unit is an architecture which takes an image as input, um, so of course you can give like your noisy image as input and then um, it predicts an image as output. Um, so in our case, we wanted to predict the noise as um, output. And then of course, like if you can predict the noise, you can just like simply subtract it. So this is a subtraction operation. Um, so you just subtract it from the noisy image and then you get the clean image. Um, and then um, unit has an interesting structure. Um, so it has a lot of convolution layers, which are shown here. Um, and then the whole reason why it kind of becomes narrow in the middle uh, is because uh, the intuition is that you want to kind of um, understand the core concepts in the image 
Um, so as it becomes narrow and narrow, it's kind of like learning the main um, structure in the image. Um, and then you're kind of like making the rest of the network here um, predict um, the actual image or the actual noise from this like core concept in the middle. Uh, so that's like a very brief kind of intuition of how units work. Mm -hmm. But um, this is a standard architecture which is available in computer vision whenever you want to predict like image to image uh, problems. So in the, in the diffusion model use case, what we do is we train a unit architecture uh, to predict the noise in the image. Um, and then of course, once you can predict the noise, you can subtract this noise and then you will get a clean image. Uh, and then now we're gonna look a bit more at training again um, at the intuition. So how would you actually do the training? Uh, so uh, of course you will start with the training set. Um, so let's assume that we're looking at the denoising problem for now. Um, so what we are gonna do is um, we'll have a lot of like training images where we have both the noisy image and the clean images, um, or even the clean images are fine uh, because you can always generate the noisy image by yourself. So, so what do we do? Uh, we'll take first take one training example um, from our data set. Um, then it can either be a clean image and then you can add noise to it, or it may already be a noise image in your training data set. Um, in the second step, what we, so we, we take an image, um, we make a unit model predict the noise in the image. Of course, in the beginning, the model is not trained, so its prediction is gonna be bad. Uh, but then once you can make a prediction, um, you can always compute a loss. You can see how well the model is predicting the noise. And then whenever you have a loss, you can always like use uh, this algorithm called back propagation, where uh, you kind of learn the, how the parameters should be improved so that the prediction gets better. Uh, so pretty much uh, all of the neural networks use this algorithm called back propagation. And again, this is something we'll cover a lot more in depth um, in the ML switch up program. Uh, but the whole idea is um, you take a noise image, make a model, predict the noise, uh, of course, it's going to be bad in the beginning. So you'll make a wrong prediction. You will have a very large loss. Um, and then you can use this algorithm called back propagation to update the weights um, so that the prediction becomes better and better. Um, and then what do you do once you actually have a trained model? Uh, of course, you want to do inference so that you can remove the noise from the image. Um, so how do you do inference? Um, so you have a noisy image as input um, if you're using image diffusion for denoising. So what you'll do is you will apply your trained unit model to predict the noise. So you'll take your noisy image, uh, you will apply the trained model to predict the noise in the image, and then you're just gonna subtract the noise. Um, so if the model learned the noise correctly, once you subtract the noise, the model should become slightly better. Um, so this is what is shown here. So we take the, first we take the noise image. Uh, we then make a prediction with the unit, uh, which is the actual noise. And then you subtract it from your one um, to get like the noise slightly better image. And then you do it multiple times so that the image gets better and better. And then you have a clean image in the end. Um, so that's like the main concept behind um, the training and inference with these diffusion models. Now, um, the next question is we we just looked at denoising. So we, um, of course, denoising is not very um, very useful as someone was asking in the um, in the in the questions. Now, um, the more interesting use cases are use cases like text to image. Um, so how do text to image models work? Now the concept is the same. Um, um, you can always start with a very noisy image as input. So in text you made this may be like complete noise to start with. Um, you will also have this text as um, as an input to the model. Um, now, what again, like the whole idea is you're gonna make your unit architecture here. So this is the unit architecture we saw before, right? So um, you want to make this unit architecture predict your noise, and then you want to like subtract the noise so that the image gets better. But um, you're gonna also apply the text. Um, so what you want is you want the architecture should be to be such that the text is used in this noise prediction. So you 
kind of predict the noise in such a way that once you remove the noise, the image also follows the text. Um, and this is done by what is called cross attention. Um, again, so the cross attention are kind of like layers which are available. Um, they are first became popular with the transformer model, which is like extremely popular now. Uh, but um, you can apply the cross attention layers uh, whenever you have like two types of inputs and you want to like kind of make one of the inputs influence the other. So in our case, we want the text to influence our unit so that it predicts noise so that once you subtract the noise, you get an image which matches the text. Um, so yeah, so we're going to use cross attention layers to, to do this. And you can use the same cross attention layer for doing other things like uh, maybe taking a mask as input and then removing that area of the image um, or taking like any other inputs, like maybe a couple of images as input um, and then getting a style image and so on. But yeah, so the whole idea is um, even with text to image models, uh, we have a unit, uh, which is an image to image model. Um, so we have a unit model, which is gonna predict the noise. Um, we make the text influences model by adding what are called the cross attention layers. Um, once we have the noise, we can of course like subtract the noise. So the image gets cleaner and then you can do it multiple times so that like the image becomes better and better. And then finally you get a high quality image that follows the text. Um, so yeah, so that's a quick um, overview of the intuition behind um, image diffusion models. Um, now, um, we're going to look at a quick um, coding exercise on how you can apply image diffusion models. Uh, but uh, maybe I'll stop here for a couple of minutes to take um, questions. Um, I'm going to maybe take questions at the end now. Um, so that it's going to be like closer to what we just discussed here. And any question we missed, we'll take at the end of the session. Um, so yeah, so um, I'll, I'll just start from the end. So. The last question is what are some of the popular image diffusion models, libraries, which are available? Um, that's a very interesting question. We're actually gonna look at one of the libraries in the next like 10 minutes. Uh, but uh, most of these models are now available in the Hugging Faith um, library. So this is like a framework which has a lot of these um, high quality models already trained. So in many of the use cases, you don't even have to like train the model, you can just, take a model from Hugging Face and then use it, which is exactly what we'll actually cover in the next 10 minutes. Um, uh, the other anonymous question is, um, how can we define uh, inference? Um, so yeah, so um, what is inference? So inference is like, um, once you have a trained model, um, how do you run this model to get a prediction? Um, so in our case, with an, let's say a text to image model, uh, what we want to do is once we have a trained model, we want to take a text input and then predict an image. Um, we'll also see this in detail um, in the coding exercise in the next session. Uh, let me take one more question and then we can go to the coding exercise. Um, after the weights are determined, so just, just Steve has a question. After weights are determined, uh, would model change them based on input, meaning it can know what weights belong to the subgroup of images? That's a really good question. So, so yeah, so we don't change the weights of the model after training is done. So the only time when the weight is changed is during training. Um, during inference, the weights are all fixed. Um, all we do is uh, we predict an output by using the fixed weights uh, learned during training and the input. So weights are never trained, uh, never changed after training. Um, so maybe, yeah, let's go to the coding exercise and I'll, I'll take the rest of the questions in the end. Um, so yeah, so the um, coding exercises in this uh, collab, um, so, um, and it should be shared with like all of you guys. So so yeah, once the uh, once session is done, um, you guys can actually look at this um, collab too. Uh, but we're just gonna go to the, um, um, to the collab now. So I'm just going to reconnect. Um, so, so again, this is going to be a short coding exercise, but um, what is important is um, you want to kind of understand how you would like use all of these things we learned now in a, in a real problem. Let's say if you're an ML engineer in, in, in your, uh, in, in one of the, these fan companies and you're actually given an ML problem. 
So I'm going to start with a real um, problem, very similar to one of the problems which I had to solve like in the past. So we're going to kind of look at the problem. Uh, I'll explain what you would um, normally do when you get a problem like this. And then of course, like because we don't have a lot of time, uh, we'll just focus on one part of the solution. Uh, so, so the context here is um, actually. Can you can you can everyone like um, see the collab? Uh, okay, someone also asked, can the link be shared in the chat? So let me let me do that. Um, Okay, so I just shared the collab um, link in the chat. Um, so all of you should have got it. Um, so yeah, so we're gonna look at the collab. If you can't see the collab, um, let me know. But um, let's say you're an ML engineer in, in a marketing company. And um, what the company wants to do is, uh, it wants to create a text to image model uh, to help creators. Um, so a creator would come with some idea they have. Um, they want to generate a poster uh, of that idea so that um, um, they have the poster available for their use case. And then instead of uh, people manually drawing the poster, you want to build a text to image model, which can take a text query and then generate the poster. Um, so here's an example. So maybe the query may be something like uh, illustration of a fancy colorful bulb. Um, and then you want the model to generate um, an image like this um, so that you can use it in a poster. Now, if you are a real um, ML engineer in, let's say, one of the fan companies, um, whenever you have any AI problem, the first step you would do would be like, um, of course, understanding like what category of AI models would be useful for your problem. In our case, it's pretty clear because you want text as input, you want to generate images. This is a text to image, um, image model use case. And of course, since you guys attended this session, um, you should be able to automatically identify that image diffusion models are good candidates for this problem. Uh, so um, then the next step you would do in real life is you would um, um, you would collect some data sets, um, do a training um, so that you have a trained model to solve this problem. You would evaluate the model, make sure the quality is good enough. Then you would like ship the model. Um, in our case, of course, like we don't have time to do an actual training. This typically takes like uh, weeks, it could even take months. Um, so we're actually going to use an existing model that's available. Um, and as someone was asking in the questions, like what's a good library which contains these models? Uh, a good library is the Hugging Face library. Um, and it has a bunch of these models which are already available. Um, and they all have this Python um, wheel. So you could just do pip install to install these packages. Um, so, so that's the first thing we're going to do. We're just going to do like pip install to install a few Python packages uh, from Hugging Face, um, which are needed for like loading and running these models. Um, so that's that's complete. Um, and then we're going to look at how we can load and run um, the image diffusion models from Stability AI. Um, these are one of the uh, most popular image diffusion models uh, which are available right now, similar to models like DALI. Um, so, so yeah, so the way you would do this is um, in Hugging Face, every model has a name. Uh, in our case, the name of the model is um, Stable Diffusion-2-1. They have different versions of models. You can go to Hugging Face and then search for that. Um, so for example, if you look at the Hugging Face documentation, um, they have a bunch of models, stable diffusion, one, 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 two, et cetera. Uh, we're gonna just use the one, two model since it's a stable model. So, so yeah, so we have the model here, the name of the model. Um, in Hugging Face, inference is all done with this very easy API, uh, which is like what is called the pipeline. Um, so we're just gonna load the model using the stable diffusion pipeline. Um, and then we're giving the model ID here. Um, you also need a scheduler, which kind of explains how the noise would be generated and would be used for um, for doing the image diffusion. Um, we have to decide like what device you're going to run this, um, and we're just going to use the GPU which is available um, on the Mac. Um, and then 
I'm just going to use a prompt here. Um, so we're going to run the model uh, for the same prompt we saw in the top, which is illustration of a fancy colorful bulb. Um, so I'm just going to do inference with the model. Um, so one of the advantages of Hugging Face is their API is like very easy to use. Um, so you just need to know the name of the model. Um, you want to just create the pipeline. Um, and then you would just run like pipeline and then give the input in bracket. So that's what we do here. So we created a pipeline. Um, then we do pipeline of prompt, uh, which is going to like run this image, run this model, and then generate the image. Um, of course, first time when you do it, you have to like load all the weights, which is why we see all of this like progress bars here. So yeah, this may take another minute for uh, the models to load. But the idea is we're going to use an image diffusion model. Um, we are going to use text as input. Um, and then we would just create the, the pipeline using hugging face. And then uh, we just use pipe of prompt. So basically, you take the pipeline give the text query as input, and then um, it's going to generate the image. So yeah, we'll wait for that to complete. Um, and then once you have an image, you can just use like uh, matplotlib to plot the image. So we want to like wait for the image to be generated and then uh, plot the image. So so now the, uh, the generation is complete, and we have this variable called um, generate image. And then we're just going to do um, uh, AX dot IM show. So we're just going to use the map plot lib function called IM show to generate the image. Um, so yeah, so this generated uh, a bulb, um, which is kind of looks like a bulb. It looks pretty fancy. Um, let me let me try one more example, um, and then we can stop. So I'm just going to say corgi with the Christmas uh, cat, and then we're just going to run this again. Uh, and then, yeah, this will take a couple of minutes. Um, but but basically the advantage is um, you don't even have to train a model because these models are already available. Um, so yeah, so um, I guess this will take a couple of minutes. So we'll we'll wait for that. Um, I'll just go to the uh, to the slides back. Um, so so yeah, so that was the deep dive. Again, we just looked at inference. Um, we didn't look at training. Um, and then now we're going to go to the summary um, and then I'll come back and uh, we can look at the result. Um, so, so what did we learn in this session? Um, we first looked at what are um, generative AI models um, intuitively. Uh, we then looked at image diffusion models, uh, which are a category of generative AI models, uh, which can generate images. Uh, it can also take a lot of things as input. It can take other images, text, boxes and so on. Uh, we looked at the intuition. Um, the whole intuition behind these models are to predict uh, noise um, using a neural network. And then you subtract the noise to get a clean image. And then you do it like multiple times. Uh, of course, these have a lot of use cases. It can be used for uh, generating creative content, um, in painting, super resolution, and so on. Um, and then we did one small coding exercise to um, to load one of these models and then do inference. Of course, it's also important to kind of uh, discuss like what did we not cover and what are next steps. Uh, we definitely did not look at the math behind these models. That's very interesting. Um, that's something we cover in detail step by step in the ML switch up program. Uh, we didn't look at a coding exercise to train the model on a real data set. Um, that's again something we cover in the assignments in in the in the program. And then of course, once you have a diffusion model, you can build real world applications using it. Let's say for in painting or for text to image. Um, this is something we cover in the uh, projects which are available with uh, with the ML switcher program. Uh, so yeah, so so that's all I had, um, and then um, I'm happy to take questions uh, from all of you folks. And I guess maybe we can quickly look at our notebook before. Um, okay, so that completed. So let's quickly see, run to see if we can see a corgi, and then yeah, so we actually got a corgi uh, with a cat, uh, Christmas cat. So yeah, so the model of course understood the um, text and it can generate images.
All right. Um, sounds good. Um, so I guess we're a little bit um, behind the schedule, uh, but uh, we can go through the questions. Um, um, so yeah, so I'll maybe go from the beginning and then cover the questions. So we had a few questions in the beginning on the video freeze. Um, um, and then this we covered. Uh, okay, so Rahul had a question. Um, how does the model know what to replace in the place of the mask? Yeah, so so that's a really good question. Um, so, so the whole idea is that um, these generative AI models have seen a lot of uh, samples in the distribution. Um, in our case, the samples are natural images. So if it so it's given that it knows a lot of natural images, it'll also know that images in one region kind of depend on images in its neighboring region. So let's say if you have an image of a lawn and then um, you have a small mask in the middle where maybe like some spectators were there and you want to like remove them, the model kind of learns that the lawn can be filled with like other grass images which are available in the neighborhood. So it kind of saw a lot of natural images. So it knows that um, given the neighboring pixels, like what should be the, um, the most common or most realistic way a region should be. Um, so it has already learned that during training and then it uses that to, to decide how to replace the, the mask. Um, that's a good question. Uh, Rahul has one more question. What if there are multiple options uh, of replacement of the surroundings? Yeah, the model is just going to pick one of them. Um, so of course, you're not going to get the exact one you are looking for. It's just going to give you something realistic. Um, uh, so yeah, so let me look at, okay, so Daniel had a question. Um, um, which is how do you train a model for text to image generation? Um, do you need to manually tag images um, or is there an automated way to um, to speed up the process? Um, so yeah, so that's a good question. So for text to image generation, you do need pairs of text and image. Um, so yeah, so it's a it's a, either a manual process with a lot of annotators or you have to use like um, data sets which are already available. Um, so yeah, I'm curious, like I, if that answers. Um, okay, so I, so yeah, so I get yeah, so so yeah, you need to like kind of manually um, create these data sets before you can train. Um, there is an anonymous question: What is inference? I think we already covered this. Um, uh, Marvin had a question uh, with the man walking in the rainy night. Uh, what determines the buildings in the background. Um, so yeah, so so that's a that's a really good question. So again, similar to what someone else asked before, um, what these models are going to do is like generate a realistic image. So in in the data sets, it may have seen that um, if you're looking at a rainy um, scene um, of a street, maybe in a city, there are often buildings around. So it kind of uses that knowledge to like kind of fill things. Of course, if you use the same uh, uh, text and then generate the image again, the next image may be completely different. Um, the only thing that's going to be constant is these images would be very realistic. So you should only really use it in applications where you want realistic images. Uh, for example, generating creative content. Um, so it's totally fine if there are like buildings in the background or maybe trees in the background. Um, so those are the use cases where uh, these models make sense. Um, so yeah. Um, also, if you guys have questions, feel free to like raise your hands, and then uh, we can also like take some live questions too. Um, uh, just the better question: Are we going to go into what uh, diffusion models actually are? Um, so yeah. So we did we did cover some of that. Uh, I'm curious, just Steve, if like if um, that makes sense, or if you have any other questions, um, I'll just let you talk. Um, okay, I can't see. Just oh, people. sure. So, I, I yeah, yeah, go yeah. ahead. Oh, uh, yeah, I was just, I, I, 
I know this is a short session. I think that question might be too long of a question. I, I, I wanted to kind of get into like uh, each of the steps, but there's not enough time. I am in the um, up level course, so maybe we'll get a chance to dive deeper into each yeah. of those stages and how, how, how they train the model um, or how they came up with the model, all the, all the, the interim intermediate inputs, outputs, how they assembled mm -hmm. that together. Yeah. Yep, yeah. Yep. I, I was curious about, about, about that part, like yeah, what yeah, those yeah. actually so, are. It's, yep, yep, it's yep, too yep. detailed so, for this session. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. So yeah. So, so as you were saying, like, yeah, so in the, in our actual like switch up program, we kind of cover all of this in depth. Um, we first look at the background needed, like Python background, um, probability background, and so on. Then we kind of cover these common neural network layers, uh, like convolution layers, ReLU, and so on. And then we kind of like cover these actual larger architectures, look at all of the details. Um, so of course, they it takes like multiple weeks and also like multiple hours, but we do cover all of these in depth in the actual uh, programs. But yeah, good question, just Steve. Awesome, awesome, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> yeah. uh, let me take some more questions. Uh, Anand had a question. Uh, what was the state of the art before um, deep learning, CNN diffusion models came in computer vision? Yeah, that's a really good question. So before um, these uh, algorithms came, the state of the art was what we call like hand-tuned models. Um, like for example, there were this histogram of oriented gradients, um, SIFT and so on. Um, these are mostly features which um, someone who has a lot of intuition would um, would kind of like build by themselves, uh, what we call like hand-tuned features. Um, and then with neural networks, like all of those features got completely replaced. So you just have a neural network architecture, you train the architecture on your data and then you get um, good models. And then transformers came where like even that got um, relaxed where you have a very general transformer architecture, you just train it on your data and then it works much better if you have lots of data. Um, so yeah, so that's how the field was kind of moving. Um, Pratip had a question, uh, what kind of neural network is image diffusion model? Uh, like we have encoder, decoder model. Um, yeah, so that's a good question. So so yeah, so basically the image diffusion model is a unit architecture, which is which actually has an encoder and a decoder. So it's an encoder, decoder architecture. Um, Pradeep, um, let me see if like if that's clear and if there is any follow up, um, I'll quickly let you let you speak. Okay, can't see Pradeep. Um, so yeah, I guess it's clear. Otherwise, maybe ask again. Um, so Rahul has a question. Um, how does it know from a text to generate grayscale or color image? Um, yeah, so this this mostly depends on the distribution on which the models are trained. Um, if you train um, basically using color images, then it's going to generate color images. Uh, if in your training set you have text to image where all the images are grayscale, then the model will generate grayscale images. So it all depends on what are the formats of data you showed uh, during training. Um, there's an anonymous question, what kind of distribution is generally used to train models? Yeah, so the distribution kind of depends on the problem. Um, so if it is a text to image problem, you would use pairs of text and image um, as input. Um, and then again, if it's a general use case, you would use like all natural images. Uh, if you have a very specific use case, like maybe a security use case, then you may just use like security images. Um, so you want to use distribution which is close to the problem you're actually trying to solve. Um, so for example, in the posters use case, uh, we may just use like lots of poster images as the input. And then the model is going to work very well for um, those cases. Um, so yeah, um, Sohak has a question. Uh, how will the model know what style to use from the style image? So the style image is a color image of the window scene and the content is black and white. How will the model know what um, we want to have? We want to apply the window style as opposed to the color style. Yeah, so so this is a good question. Um, this all depends on the order in which we give the images. 
Um, so, so basically during training, it all depends on what the model learned during training. Um, during training, if you have like a color image and a style image and the actual output, ground truth output we used um, during training um, got the winter as the style, then it'll know that it should take the style from the second image. Um, so basically, yeah, you have lots of examples for the model to learn and during the training, and it all depends on how those examples were um, set up. Um, and then if you set it up a different way, the model may learn it uh, differently. Uh, let me see if like that's clear. Okay, so let me, okay, so Hag is here. So yeah, I'm curious, so Hag, like, um, does that make sense? Uh, yeah, uh, thank thank you. I, um, uh, I, uh, I, I get what you mentioned, but um, one other, thought uh -huh. that for me is that um, <clears throat> that means um, uh, we would need to use a large number of training images for say winter scenes, right? Uh, in this particular example that we have, or uh, because uh, it would need to extract, uh, you know, it would need to learn all the winter scenes uh, uh, mm -hmm. from all of those training images. Uh, and uh, then it kind of is how is it uh, how does it scale because uh, mm -hmm. a text be like any random like I, you know like i say i i uh, you know yeah I, you see what i'm getting at right so mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Could yeah. Many different styles, yeah 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 so so it it all depends right so so basically like yeah so if in your use case um, you care a lot about winter scene then you want to add a lot of like examples of that so that model learns that really well. Um, in general, for some of these use cases, like um, like basically like even if you just have one example, then the model will learn that it has to like kind of make the image more whiter um, because the, the style image is actually kind of white. So the model can learn those information with a small number of examples. Like um, typically what the model would do is like kind of understand how the, like what are the global color available in the style image and then try to transfer that. So a lot of that things you can actually learn without too many images. But if you want like very high quality winter images um, and maybe like the snow, like you want the model to like kind of understand the snow very well, then you need like more examples. So, so this is a common problem you will also see in industry um, where like it's very easy to get an ML model to let's say what we call like the 90% accuracy, but going from 90 to 91 or going from 90 to 99 is a lot harder. And that's where you have to get a lot more training examples to a lot of like hill climbing to do that. Um, so in reality, whenever like these models are deployed in production, you would have large teams which actually like collect data and then do annotation so that you have lots of examples available. Um, so kind of training on like millions to billions of images is like very common with these models. Um, and that's where the power of these models come because you have more examples a model can learn better but yeah that's totally a valid concern like yeah if you just have like 10 examples these models are not going to work well uh, but you could also do what is called transfer learning where you could use a previously trained model like the one we saw in hugging face and then maybe just like kind of fine tune it with a few examples and then the model would kind of learn a few core concepts from those examples but yeah that's a that's a valid point um, so typically you need lots of examples just to um, so yeah, does that make sense? You have like any follow up questions? No, that that's 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 it. Thanks, I appreciate that. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank yeah, you there's a me. there's an interesting question by an anonymous attendee. Uh, does an AI ML engineer need to create new models, or is it just enough to know how to use existing models? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so so that's a good question. So so in in reality, it's a combination of two. Um, so I would say. You would maybe do like 50% of the time you would actually create new models. Uh, at least in my experience, that was the case. Um, and then maybe roughly 50% of the time you would um, kind of like use existing models. Um, it also depends on where you're working. Like for example, like if you're in a fan company, um, you want to make sure that you're like very careful about licenses. So if you don't have a good model available publicly with the right commercial license, you may have to build the model from scratch, but if you have commercially licensed models available, you can always like start from there. Um, so in general, it's good to know both so that 
um, irrespective of what problem you have to solve in the industry, you would be like kind of well equipped so to solve it. Um, yeah, good question, Abhinav. Um, Abhinav, are there any other questions you feel are interesting? Because I think there are way too many questions. Maybe we could select some questions and um, answer them. Um, sure, there is also, also a hand... Jay, feel free to actually scan through the questions and the ones that you find interesting. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, yep, that makes sense. Um, there is also a hand raised, so maybe I'll I'll take that. Um, so yeah, Amit has a question. Um, um, so yeah, Amit, what's your question? Yes, hi. Um, so uh, you know, in the traditional AI or not traditional, but whatever non-generative AI, uh, you are basically taking an image as input and you know, like maybe identifying the content, like, oh, is there a cat or a dog in the image? So you're starting with a lot of, like, if you look at pixels, a lot of pixel data coming down to a little text or something. But in the generative AI, you're going in the reverse direction, you know, taking some text input and generating RGB values for so many pixels. So mm -hmm. it really seems like magic to me. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. how does it do that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a, that's a really good question. So so basically, um, because you are generating so many pixels, um, there is this whole thing like the number of parameters which a model is needs to predict something. Um, for generative AI models, that's much higher because like you are predicting a lot of output. Uh, but the concepts are the same. Um, so, so the main difference between like the classification model you mentioned before, where maybe you have like images as input, you predict like cats and dogs as output. Main difference between that and generative AI models is um, these models have to predict a lot more um, output data. So you need a lot more training samples to like train these models. So of course the, the models are more complex, much more larger and need a lot more training data to train. Um, but the fundamental concepts are all the same. Like you have training data where like um, you have some input and some outputs and then you kind of like train the weights of the model so that it kind of minimizes a loss so that it learns the concept in the training data. So the fundamental concepts are all the same, but of course, like as you mentioned, I mean, like this is a much harder problem because you need a lot more output data. Um, and that is why the size of these models are much larger. And also you need like way more training data to train these models. Um, so yeah, definitely need a lot more compute. And that's why these models never used to work like maybe five years back um, because both the size of data and the compute was not available then. Uh, but the concepts are all the same. Um, and yeah, we cover these concepts in a lot more depth in the in the actual program. Um, so yeah, does that make sense? You have any follow-up questions? Um, no, that's all. Thank you. Yep, yep, thank you for asking. Um, there's one more hand raised, uh, Victor. Um, yeah, Victor, what's your question? My question is, uh, do you need to publish papers uh, to be a machine learning AI engineer or uh, yep, yep. Know, something you, you get yep. to learn the curse yeah, that yeah. you, yep. Yeah, so that's a that's a really good question. So we actually had a session before um, and I've been able, like maybe the video of that session may be available, but one of the one of the topics we actually covered in that session was like, what is the difference between let's say an ML engineer and uh, applied scientists or a research scientist. Um, so typically for ML engineers, uh, publication is not required. Um, there are some companies where you can publish, like for example, like in Amazon, uh, companies like very open to people publishing. There are some other companies where it's very hard to publish, like Apple, when I was in Apple, it was much harder. But in general, like as an ML engineer, um, you are not expected to publish in most companies, uh, but you are expected to like understand this new algorithm so that you can use it in your work. But if you actually take a research scientist or an applied scientist title, then there's a lot more expectation to like publish new papers and extend the field. So it all depends on the type of job title you are, um, you're taking. Um, so yeah, Victor, does that make sense? You have, do you have any follow-up questions? Oh, that's good. Thank you. Yep. Thank you for asking. Yeah, there's there's one question in the Q and A that's let's say a, a bit different from all the questions mm -hmm. asked. Um, I yeah. have a mechanical engineering degree and currently working in a non tech role. Uh, will this program help me uh, transition and become uh, an hands on ML engineer? If yes, how yeah. long will it take, and what is required for me to join? 
Um, yep, yep. So um, anonymous attendee just respond to any email in your inbox from interview kickstart. It would go to your program advisor. Uh, you should be good to go. Uh, chances are that will be starting from entry level. Uh, it would take some time. I'd say about 12 to 15 months sort of time for you to complete the program. And uh, But we would also have to look at your career objectives, right? Uh, if you're looking to pivot from a mechanical engineering role to machine learning engineering, then you would have to be open to, I'd say, entry level ML engineering opportunities, right? And we do help with all of that. In the program, you would sit down with career coaches, technical recruiters who would help you figure out like 10, 12, 15, 20 companies that would be a good fit, which should be a primary target, which should be a secondary target, will help you prepare your LinkedIn, your resume, GitHub repository, all of that, right? You would, you would, as Jay mentioned, you would end up doing a bunch of mini projects, caption projects that would go on your go on your profile. But talk to your program advisors, right? And uh, they would they would help you. Um, and that goes for everyone else, folks. If you have any questions on the program, how Interview Kickstart helps uh, folks pivot to machine learning data science sort of work, uh, respond to any email in your inbox from IK, your program advisors would reach out to you. Sure. Yeah. Um, please okay. carry on. And, and, and maybe also to add like to the question. So so yeah, so, so basically, of course, like even if your background is different, um, you can of course learn these concepts and then become really good. But as Abhinav was saying, of course, like if you are coming from a very different background, you may have to spend more effort for more time. Uh, but in the program, we actually kind of cover pretty much everything that's needed, like all the way from Python language to like the math that's needed. Um, so it all depends on the amount of effort you are ready to put and the time. Yep. Uh, we have Aditya and Vamshi who have raised their hands. Actually. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So maybe like Aditya, do you want to ask a question? Hi, Jay. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. I have a question that uh, uh, is the solution output space for this models are finite. Uh, basically, what I mean to say, this large language models are huge, right? A lot of parameters and all. But let's suppose if I train a model, which is small, and can I just output everything in a for loop, which will output all the potential outcome which can be possible from this model. So which makes this model as a finite space, uh, what it can produce. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, so the, yeah, the space is of course finite because if you look at the, like let's say this image diffusion model, right? Um, it's only gonna predict a fixed sized input. Um, maybe it's like 100 by 100. And let's say at each location, there is like, um, I don't know, like 128 different values. Um, so so yeah, so the, the, the space of output, which are predicted, it's, it's always finite. Um, and that's one of the requirements for like machine learning models too. Um, and that's why you kind of pose the problem so that it, it is finite. Um, so yeah, so these are finite, but of course, like as someone was asking before, compared to like simpler models, like classification models, you have a lot more output to predict, which is why these models are a lot more complex. Um, so yeah, Aditya, does that answer the question? Yeah, sure, thank you. Yep, thank you for asking. Uh, Vamshi, Vamshi, like, do you want to ask the question? Oh, yeah, let me allow you to speak. Yeah. Yeah, I did miss some of the part of the questions too. Uh, but regarding one of the uh, models, uh, so obviously the models that are available in Hugging Force or any of those repositories uh, needs a lot of um, fine tuning. They are pre trained, but fine tuning. So Will there be, uh, do we have to have like a, if you want to be part of the, uh, you know, for the fine tuning, do we need to know the full ML concepts or full ML mm -hmm. engineer or can be a software developer with uh, uh, some percentage of ML knowledge? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so yeah, so basically like, um, so if you, let's say if you're, going to target kind of becoming an ML engineer um, who is, um, I guess it, it doesn't really matter whether you're only going to focus on fine tuning, but the bigger question is like, as someone was asking before, this whole difference between being an ML engineer versus maybe a applied scientist. Um, so if you're becoming an ML engineer, then uh, of course you need to understand ML and you also need to understand how you can program in Python. But if you are coming as a software engineer, um, then 
you just need to like understand and learn the ML pieces. Um, and also like the other thing as you were saying is, um, um, and this is also something we covered in a previous session. So um, even the whole like machine learning program, there are like different um, roles or jobs you can apply. So if you're becoming an NLP engineer, then you only need to understand the natural language uh, processing side. If you are going to become a computer vision engineer, you just have to understand the computer vision side. Um, so of course you don't have to understand all of ML for like all the different roles, but it all depends on the type of roles you're focusing. But um, let's say if you're becoming a, um, I don't know, uh, an image diffusion or generative AI engineer, mm -hmm. then you would need to understand both the fine tuning and maybe like the, even the pre-training of those models. So that will be like the amount of scope you should, you should cover. Yeah, for so, generative yeah. AI space, if I want to be on the generative AI and how much percentage of uh, machine learning um, do we just need to know um, not as in-depth or just on a high level um, mm -hmm. knowledge of the machine learning concepts for uh, to work on yeah, the gen yeah. AI applications? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, so I would say um, it's still good to know the fundamentals like of, of course, you want to learn how to program in Python if you are not familiar with the okay. language because pretty much all the models are written in Python. So that's important. You want to understand some fundamental concepts like um, what, what like what are probabilities, what is like linear algebra. Again, these are things we cover in depth in the whole like ML switch up course. Um, then you want to understand the basics of these neural networks because like all of these image diffusion models as we saw before has a bunch of like neural network layers. Um, so that's important. And then once you understand that much, you can kind of like focus on the generative AI side. Um, so basically we have like different um, kind of like um, sections available in the whole like ML switch up program and they would cover all of this, but you can like skip other session, sections like maybe on like um, NLP if you're gonna be a image diffusion like um, or an image generative AI engineer. Um, so you can kind of, you should definitely get the fundamentals and then you can pick just the area you want to focus in depth. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so yeah, yeah. Thank you for asking. Yeah, there's um, another question uh, in, in the Q&A. Uh, could yeah. a 10 year uh, software engineer get a position as, as an L5, L6 or would he or she start as L3 and L11? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so this was an interesting question which also came in some of the past like kind of sessions. Um, so, so yeah, so basically like, um, of course, like if you are doing a switch from maybe a software engineering role to an ML role, uh, then you want to kind of look at like, what are the responsibilities of the role? Um, so of course, as an, um, let's say an L5, um, then you, you want to be like, let's say senior, senior ML engineer, right? So, so the responsibilities of the role would be like, kind of, um, of course, knowing the, the Python coding, ML fundamentals, being able to build the models and also some ML system design. Um, so we cover all of that in the switch up program. Um, and then of course, like you will need some projects too. And then we have some projects. Um, so you could of course, like kind of try to maybe apply to the senior level. Uh, one thing I wouldn't recommend is like, kind of like trying to apply the same role at the tenure, maybe like a staff or a senior staff, because then that may be harder for you to like kind of, um, reach there because the field is also changing. Uh, but all of the fundamentals you need um, to kind of work well, let's say as a senior engineer, even the system design side things, we would definitely cover in the program. Um, so I would say maybe start at like senior level so that you're kind of comfortable. And then you can of course like get promoted and go to the next level. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Abhinav, like anything you wanna add? Yeah, no, I just would say on the same line, also, um, many a times uh, folks really underestimate the transferable skills that they already have, uh, right? If, if you already have 10 years of software engineering experience, uh, just I'd say having that fundamental understanding of software development lifecycle, right? That in itself is really, really important. Uh, you would already have really good programming proficiency, right? Uh, then expertise in, let's say, data handling and storage, right? You would have worked with databases, data modeling, data storage solutions. That's that's relevant in ML engineering as managing pre-processing data is as part of ML workflow. 
if you have worked on API development, then then building consuming APIs, right? If you, if you know how to do that, then integrating ML modules into backend systems, right? That's transferable. Uh, scalable system design architecture, as you said, Jay, right? That's directly transferable uh, in, in, in ML engineering. Cloud DevOps when you're deploying models into production. And then the entire behavioral side of uh, engineering is, is also transferable. So chances are, uh, if you're at L5, uh, but but end of the day, it really depends on how well you do in the interviews as well. You would go through four to seven, four to eight rounds of interviews, right? Coding, design, ML design, behavioral, all of that. So how well you do in the interviews as well. Uh, that also ends up deciding your level of seniority. But chances are that you will definitely not be starting at entry level, right? It could be if you're at level N, either level N or worst case scenario N minus one, right? And um, as you said, Jay, we, we do have, let's say, not just teaching you machine learning, which is the first 38, 39 weeks of the program, but after that, there is 16 weeks of detailed interview preparation, right? Preparing you for data structures, algorithms, system design interview rounds, ML design interview rounds, behavioral leadership interview rounds, all of that. That's also covered in an ML switch up curriculum, uh, the program that we have. So hope that helps. Yeah, there is also an interesting question from an anonymous attendee. Um, is there a different level of um, uh, interview kickstart ML course for someone who has exposure to um, ML content before um, in the opinion of like, do you want to take that? Is that like a shorter set of sessions yeah. they could take? So uh, I think I'd say we would have to assess because what what we realized initially, we, we had different entry points in the program. Uh, there were folks who came to us and said that uh, I know Python. Uh, and is there a way I can skip Python? But when we when we audited them, we realized that they, they are not, I'd say, at the level that is expected. Also, the way, I'd say, for example, if you're a software engineer, you would usually use Python to, to build and maintain software applications, right? Uh, so scripting, automation, backend development, uh, uh, creating APIs, right? Using frameworks like Django or Flask, or all of that. Compare that to how a data scientist uses Python, um, they, they use it to analyze and interpret data, to accept insights and make data-driven decisions, right? So I'd say uh, things like data processing, statistical analysis, creating data visualization, they would end up using libraries like NumPy or Pandas for data manipulation or Matplotlib, uh, Seaborn for data visualization, Scikit for ML. Uh, and compare that to ML engineering roles, they, they would, I'd say, use, they would, their role is to take these ML models developed by data scientists and integrate them into production system, right? So uh, their uh, use is to de deploy ML models into um, production. Um, and hence, I'd say, I usually recommend folks to not to skip any modules, right? It's, for example, Python is four to six weeks, but learning, learning, let's say Python from someone like Jay, who does that in, their, in his day-to-day his -day work, they would also be studying, let's say, use cases, right? Different, different uses of Python. That's that ends up becoming really, really valuable uh, while while you're learning, right? And hence, we have disallowed skipping modules. Uh, we initially used to do that, um, but yeah. Another thing that you might consider is once you are done with the trial period, which is first two weeks, you can actually accelerate through topics. So let's say you're in week three and you would want to see what's there in week four or five or six, we would upload those recordings to your account, your learning management system. So you can go through those faster. So that's that. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, there is one more interesting question. Um, is the course focused on uh, switching into the ML role plus how to land uh, ML AI job? Um, yeah, so the switch up program would uh, completely cover that. We'll cover all the basics. We'll cover advanced topics. Um, we'll also like kind of give mock interviews and even behavioral rounds and everything. So yeah, so the switch up program should completely cover both. Um, so up and up, like anything, anything to add? No, uh, so as you said, I'd say first 38, 39 weeks are about teaching you ML. Uh, we will start from Python, uh, statistics, essential mathematics, then classical ML, right? Supervised and supervised ML, then modern ML. You would end up doing lots of interesting, very interesting assignments on a weekly basis. Then, then mini projects, then capstone projects, 
uh, throughout the program you would have guidance from folks like jay all our instructors are at say industry practitioners from top tech companies right that's there and then we'll help you prepare for interviews as well starting from interview strategy linkedin resume we also have our own career services which is if you have done well in the program we would also help you at say connect with companies uh, we have a vast alumni network instructor network all of that spe specifically for us switch up students and then preparing you for coding interviews design behavioral interviews all of that uh, Jeff. Uh, another question by linger ready what is the course duration as we are working how much time we need to spend weekly um, so about i would say 10 to 12 hours right there are two live classes a week uh, one is on sunday that's from 9 am to 1 pm pacific so that's about four hours of commitment there uh, then another live class on thursday evening uh, 6 to 8 pm pacific 9 to 11 eastern so that's two hours more so six hours of commitment in, in live classes and then you would spend about four to six hours working on homework assignments usually that right so about i'd say 10 to 12 hours on, on a weekly basis uh then ready that's that uh, yeah. there's, there's a very interesting question. What are some considerations to have when making a transition to, to ML engineering management from software engineering management? Uh, Jay, so if you would want to take that up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I think uh, that's interesting. Um, typically, the way I look at, um, let's say, ML management is um, there are two parts. One is, of course, like the whole like ML knowledge so that um, you can either like do the projects well, have your team do the project well. Um, so there, the amount of skills you need is very similar to what an individual contributor would need. Um, and we would cover like um, all of that, like in the switcher program. Um, and then the second is like the whole like people management side, uh, which is completely transferable from, let's say your management experience in software engineering. So you should be pretty much be able to like kind of transfer all of that into the ml management side um so yeah so it, so it shouldn't be a lot more extra work compared to like maybe an ic doing a switch from software engineering to um to the ml side um i've been up like anything anything to add on top okay, pretty much covered um, um i think Praveen has uh, raised his hand uh Praveen, uh do you have a question? You should be able to speak if you unmute yourself. Uh, how are you doing today? Yeah. Hi, I'm good. Thank you for, uh, for the session. Hey, uh, so I, am, I have 18, 19 years of experience and uh, I, uh, of, after software engineering, I also did data engineering and um, I am engineering manager since last few years. So from engineering manager, can I transform to a, uh, like a manager of engineering manager of AI ML projects or do I have to, you know, first become a AI ML engineer and then trans again transform to engineering manager? Yep, yep. Yeah, so, so that's very similar to the other question we saw too. Um, so, so again, like, um, so, it, so it's all about like kind of meeting the needs um, or the, the expectations of the interview. Um, so of course, like typically if you look at an ML engineering manager interview round, um, it has like two main sections. One is like all the people management side um, where they will have questions about like, how do you kind of grow people's career and how do you kind of like address conflicts and so on. Um, all of those are completely transferable from your engineering management manager experience in like, the software side the side um so basically that's actually an advantage because you could use like all of your skills you acquired as an engineering manager there directly in the interviews um and then the next set of um skills which are checked in the interviews would be the actual like technical skills um so that is something which like the program would cover um so you should be able to directly apply to like um, ml engineering manager roles um, does that make sense, Praveen? Do you have any follow up yeah. questions? No, I uh, I got your got the answer. You're not sure how much um, will you know will be able to execute it, but uh, yeah, because you know, it's, uh, how do we uh, manage projects which you haven't done on hands on so much? Right? Like, how will the company trust you to do that? Is 
like yeah. um like yeah. I, I even for engineering manager here i had i was a software engineer before and a data engineer and then easily became engineering manager but uh, not done aiml not sure how much convincing would it be for for uh, candidates to directly become an engineering manager of aiml i i trust what you're saying but i'm not sure how it so, would it be easy or hard uh, so Pravin, definitely not not easy right and and uh, specifically when we are talking about companies like i'd say uh, large scale tech organization that are that are driving all the innovation in an aiml field. that said uh, think of some of the things um, what you would have to do is build ml knowledge right so so i'd say I, I would recommend start by learning the fundamentals of ml right supervise on supervise deep learning nlp computer vision all of that okay? whichever way you want to take uh, about learning that then gain gain practical experience right that is that is start working on ml projects so could be with personal projects could be with that's a contributing to open source ml project or collaborating with in your current organization i'd say uh, co start collaborating with with teams that are taking ml initiatives right understand the tools the frameworks um, all of that but also be aware that let's say for example data engineering right ml engineers and uh, machine learning is data driven so if you have an understanding of data engineering data preparation data quality um, data pipelines data storage data labeling that's that's going to help you even in ml engineering your experience with team leadership management right that's that's highly transferable leading a team setting goals mentoring resolving conflicts right all these are valuable skills in in any engineering management okay? project management that's also i'd say or communication all these are very valuable skills right so there are certain skills that you would have to acquire to become an ml engineering manager that's what a program like us right there are there are multiple other programs out there uh, but programs like us would enable you to do so uh, you would be able to talk about hands on um, i'd say um, ml experience with the capstone projects that you would have those are very very detailed and then you would have the other transferable skills right so you should be we have lots of folks i'd say who are already engineering managers director of engineering folks who are going through this research program so you'd be able to achieve the career outcome that you're hoping for Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, and also maybe maybe to add, like, um, even though it looks too hard, the advantage you have is like you'll also have a team where there are actually like ML experts in the team. Um, so some of the expectation from the manager is not to actually like not just come up with the technical solutions, but making sure that the goals are set well, there's a good roadmap, there's like accountability and so on, which are like highly transferable skills. So if you learn the basics of ML through the program, um since you can transfer all of the other skills and also you have like actual ml engineers who would be reporting to you who could kind of also cover some of the technical side um so it shouldn't be like really hard so i guess with good practice you should be able to do it gotcha thank you so um i think there are a bunch of um more questions um uh, how many hands-on projects will be doing during the course in how many months? Uh, another question by Lingaradi, which is total course duration. Total course duration is, I'd say, the, the, there are first 39 weeks that are about teaching you machine learning. So that's, that's the uh, teaching part. Then there is 16 weeks of ML interview preparation, uh, or in case of data science, right, similar, similar course duration. So about 54, 55 weeks of total duration. And then you have six months of live job support period that's the time when you'll actually be interviewing and if you have any issues any questions any doubts you can keep on doing i'd say uh coaching sessions for doubt clarifications live one-to-one -one mock interviews for feedback all of that right so you'll have interview kickstart complete support for a duration of about 18 months okay. uh, ready. hope that helps uh, how many hands-on projects um i'd say about four to six mini projects, uh, anonymous attendee, and then at least one capstone project for you to be eligible for our career services. You're more than welcome to do multiple capstone projects. You're more than welcome to bring in your own capstone projects as well. We'll look at the problem statement, use case that you're trying to solve, if you have the data that is required and all of that. But yeah, four to six mini projects and at least one capstone project. Okay. Uh, hope that helps. And 
how much ml ops and ai ops uh, will be uh, taught in the uh, program um, jay would you want to take it up or uh, should i should i uh, take it yeah yeah so so yeah so we do have a section on ml ops which kind of cover pretty much all the basics you need um, ml ops is also like a new field in machine learning which is kind of becoming popular um, so i feel like you will have enough to like apply it in industry and enough to like kind of learn new new kind of like um, algorithms and solutions that come um, but we do have a section in the switch of course which covers all the basics um, yeah. yeah i've been up like anything to add yeah so i think there, there are about i think 7 to 9 weeks corely dedicated to ml ops it, it's it's one of the most important as a part of day to day work interview process of ml engineering right so we would we would first start with basics of software system design right so general design principles latency throughput caching load balancers right application sharding uh, rate limiters logging monitoring all of that then ml design principles so i'd say uh, system design for ml systems reliability scalability maintainability adaptability uh, different types of ml systems online prediction versus batch predictions edge computing cloud computing right um, um, online learning versus offline learning all of that then we will move to ml project scoping so let's say um, walking through data that is needed what model to use analysis susceptibility of uh, deployment constraints right functional versus non functional features then we'll move to ml model training so distributed training um, or need for large model training right how do you schedule training parallel architectures computing experiment tracking versioning logging model artifacts uh, then ml model deployment so uh, step by step to 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 productionize ml models creating apis converting inference code to api containerizing and then creating docker images right all of that then model performance and retraining and then model monitoring diagnosing production fault values all of that so very detailed modules on on uh, ml ops uh, daniel uh, hope that helps i think you have uh, raised you had raised your hand so if you want if you have a follow up question on that feel free to ask so you should be able to speak any uh, more if it's if it's all good then you will take other questions okay it seems that that, that we were able to answer the question uh, uh, Jay, how, how are we on the on the time side? Uh, um, yeah, so I have another five more minutes. So I'll have to drop off around eight twenty. Um, okay. So I, I see a couple of interesting questions here. So sure, um, one question is like for a senior software engineer, does it make sense financially to switch to AIML? Um, I think it does. Um, the the salaries are typically much higher on the AIML side. And I feel like if you um, actually take the program, understand the fundamentals of ML, you should be able to like apply for the senior ML engineer role itself. Um, so there should definitely be a, a, a good bump in the salary. Uh, but Abhinav, like, what do you think? Yeah, uh, yeah so I think I'd say another way uh, to, to do this is there's a website named levels.fyi. Okay? Uh, that's an open source website. So and it has great detailed compensation data. So I would suggest that's going to that and then try comparing level to level or to or right? Let's say L5 software engineer versus L5 ML engineer, right? Uh, for the same company, and you would see the difference uh, the, or the sort of compensation, right? Also at each level, there is, there is a band, right? Uh, there is always a range, but yeah, um, which is decided on how well you've done, the, done in the interview process, but yeah. Level to level, org to org, and ML engineer would usually be paid uh, higher than than software engineer, and then much higher than other roles like data engineer or I'd say um, SRE DevOps engineer sort of thing. So financially, definitely, and then the growth potential uh, of of the domain, right? So that's it. Okay. Uh, a couple of folks have raised their hands. We'll we'll take those and then we'll wrap up. Yeah. Um, yep. Yep. Yeah. Sounds good. Uh, Arati, you have raised your hand. Uh, how are you doing today? Uh, how can we help? So, Arati, if you're speaking, uh, we are not able to hear you. Okay. Uh, Madhuri, do you have a question? Uh, how can we help? 
Uh, thank you, Dashrath and Jay, for the session. Um, yeah. A quick one question I have is, uh, what what skills uh, do someone as a product manager for ML uh, on in ML need, uh, and what level of depth do we need to cover in ML uh, versus being a software uh, engineering manager? Okay, so Madhuri, and let me know if I if I misunderstood the question. Uh, what you're asking is you're currently a product manager. If you want to switch to machine learning, what are the skills that you would have to acquire? Is, is that is that fair to say? Yeah, I, I actually played uh, I played both roles as a uh, software manager, engineering manager, as well mm -hmm. as a product. So I'm trying to say, uh, check on when switching to an ML role. Um, if I have to segregate myself between a product manager and a software engineering manager, what are the differences of the skill sets I need, and uh, in terms of being successful in the product uh, in either of the roles, what is the difference between uh, uh, differing from a generic product manager? Let me ask you this: generic product manager versus an ML product manager. Maybe I, I'll, I'll limit it to that. Sorry. Yeah, maybe I, I can take a shot. So, so, so I guess it's a product manager. Uh, I mean, there are different types of product managers in different companies. Like um, there are some companies where you have like very technical product managers. And for them, um, it's really good to understand the basics of ML. Of course, you don't have to understand like different um, architectures in ML, but you still need to understand how the model development life cycle works. Um, like you need to collect data, you train the model first, it's not going to give higher quality results. You'll have to do this multiple times. So understanding that life cycle is really useful so that you can kind of plan how to like set roadmaps and milestones and make sure that things are working. Uh, also, you can understand problems which are there in your teams and then kind of raise that well. Um, so that understanding fundamentals of ML and being familiar with the model development process would be very useful. Um, up enough, like anything to add on top? Yeah, uh, no, uh, so Madhuri, and again, so to, to add on to that, right, we, we would never want to set up incorrect expectations for any of our students. So, if, if the goal is to, if you're currently a technical product manager, uh, and there are different flavors to product management, right, uh, and the goal is to become an ML product manager, then this program, the, the ML switch up program we have, right, that's that probably would be an overkill, right? Because um, I'd say this is a program for someone to, to become a machine learning engineer or to become an ML engineering manager. Right? That's the core purpose behind this, uh, this program, right? We are in the process to come up with a curriculum for someone who just, I'd say, especially for technical program managers and technical product managers, where they, they want to, they do not want to leave their current domain, but, but I'd say, become AI ML enabled, right? So there, there should be a separate curriculum or separate program for that, but I'd say this probably would be an overkill. But if the end goal is to become, let's say an ML engineering manager, if they're already a software engineering manager, then yeah, this, this is going to be a great fit uh, for you. Um, Thank you. Yeah? For response. Thank you. Yeah, cheers. Um, so I guess okay, it's I, 8, 20 already. Maybe should we wrap up, Abhinav? Yep. Yeah. Yep, I think I'd say, uh, Joyce, I see uh, it's a bunch of folks who have raised their hands. Uh, folks really, really appreciate all of you coming in, participating, spending, I'd say, uh, a couple of hours of your valuable time. Hope the hope the session was interesting. Uh, there, there were just way too many questions that we have not been able to answer. Uh, please reach out to your program advisor. We'll, we'll also have our uh, program advisors reach out to you. Uh, and and help you with with the questions that that went unanswered or if you have any questions about the program or, or anything in general right how to, how do you go about transitioning to aiml just i'd say respond to any email in your inbox from ik and uh, we, we would help you navigate through it but really appreciate all of your questions uh, have a great rest of the evening uh, take care jay really really great session um, thanks thanks so much for your time thank you so much for participating everyone yes folks bye bye bye